go to the zoo. And there's never a guy there with a megaphone saying, DON'T FEED THE CROCODILES! Because there doesn't need to be. Because crocodiles are just inherently dangerous. And we know this. We know that if you look into these cold, dead eyes of one of these creatures, that it's a prehistoric, amoral monster that will eat you. So you instinctively avoid it. No warning sign needed. Now, amoral, let's just talk about that for a second here, because that's an interesting word. What's the difference? Moral means good or right as perceived by the wider society or individuals within that society. Immoral means, you know, bad and stuff. And the definitions of these things are obviously morphing and flexible through, through history. For example, it was perfectly moral in Mayan culture to kidnap people from the neighboring village, force them to build um, a, a pyramid, and then sacrifice them on top of it so that the sun would come up the next day. This is no longer deemed to be moral. And then we have this other word, amoral, which merits its own separate entry in the dictionary, which is not really concerned with, not bothered with moral judgments, like the crocodile. It, it's just not interested, no problem. Now, I have an interesting take on this, in that I live with an amoral creature who pees in my bedroom repeatedly. And I take this personally. On the, about the fourth or fifth time, I became quite irate. Until my daughter said to me, Dad, it's because you didn't take the dog out for a pee and he's just getting his own back on you. He's obeying his nature. Now, what happens if you work in an amoral environment? What happens if you work for an environment where the sole concern is a return on investment for shareholders? If that's the sole concern, it stands to reason that every other thing is of secondary concern and pretty soon we're heading into an amoral environment. Now, how do you survive in that? How do you thrive in that? How do you get on with that? I think a hugely important part of that is recognizing the nature of the creature that you're dealing with. Safe, not safe. Same in terms of the kind of organization that you choose to hang around in or work in. Recognize it for what it is and understand its nature. People don't do this. You see, I was in the boat and there was the severe hit the fins and they were circling the boat and I had a really big cold on my foot. But man, it was such a hot day and I just had to go for a paddle. And then a shark attacked me. What did you think was going to happen? If you understand some basics, you'll survive. Number one, you have to have a plan. Jim Rohn's great quote. And if you have a plan, that means you don't end up being part of somebody else's plan. Because if you end up being part of someone else's plan, guess what they have planned for you? Not much. That means you need to have a map. You need to have a road map for your career. If you have no map, you get to the end of the driveway, you're in stress mode. You get to the end of the road, you're in stress mode. Get yourself a map. Get yourself some directions on where you're going. Second, you need to ignore your mother's advice. What do Irish mothers, hi mum, always say? Don't talk to strangers. Bad advice. You need to talk to strangers. You need to turn these strangers into friends, into, into a network of confidants and co-conspirators on your part. The original Credits for Lord of the Rings took 22 minutes to scroll up on screen. That's how many people it took as a group, as a team, to put that thing together. Get yourself a team around you. Third, Sun Tzu said if you want to go into some kind of a conflictual situation, you need to know three things. You need to know yourself, you need to know your opponent, and you need to know the ground that you're going to be fighting on. Now, that is such common sense. You know, come on. Get a clue here, folks. This is basic stuff. And yet most people shy away from doing this. They, they don't want to acknowledge the reality. And, and they, don't want to, they don't want to get into the detail of what has to be done in order to make themselves ready to not be exploited. Why? Because it feels like maintenance. And no one likes doing maintenance. It's a major flaw in, in humanity. So if you find yourself in one of these environments, what are you going to do? You're going to recognize the creature for what it is. They've been doing this for ever such a long time, and they're not going to stop anytime soon. There's a lamentable frequency and a lamentable repeatability of this kind of thing. You see it in the headlines. They've, they've just become so commonplace now. We, we tolerate it. We even kind of, you know, what did you think they were going to do? We even kind of expect it sometimes now. It's normalized behavior. And if you're in an environment where that has become the norm, it is imperative that you take that control back. I think they could do better signs in the zoo, and I wish that they had signs like these outside certain corporate environments that I've worked in. 
but they don't. So you know what? Recognise the animal you're dealing with and you might escape with your limbs intact. Thank you very much.